you will be my witnesses. You know what? That's a great segue into, into the word that God gave me to share today. And I get to, to launch this brand new series. And I am so excited because a lot of us probably have a, a mindset that blocks out the opportunities that God presents us to be a witness. Why? Because we might be afraid that we'll mess it up. But you know with the Holy Spirit, He is so much greater than what we can do. Amen? He, if we mess it up, He always is there to rescue us. Let's take a moment. We're going to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I need you to rescue me because if I'm going to share your word and it's going to, going to make a difference in all of our lives, it has to be you speaking and not me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for opening the eyes of our understanding, our hearts, to know you and to understand, to hear your voice and to walk out your plan for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory to God. How many of you would call yourself an introvert? Let me see your hands. An introvert. You don't really, you're not the one that is always out there striking up conversations with people. I am an extrovert. You probably didn't notice that. My wife is an introvert, and whenever I'm with her, she's always afraid of what's going to come out of my mouth because it's going to put her in a position. Now, the thing is, I am in the business world and it puts me in circles where there's a lot of influential people and she is tagging along sometimes and she has to work with it. And she's really actually become quite good at appearing to be an extrovert. And I believe that when we hear the word of God today, some of you that in your minds you are an introvert are going to realize that you might be, but God isn't. And the more we let him come and work in and through our lives, the more we realize how fun life can be when you're not afraid of what other people think. Amen. Amen. So the big idea of this series, let me just lay this out. The series that we're going to be on, Pastor Josh is going to continue this next week, is to examine the idea of being witnesses for Christ. Now that right there causes some of us to tremble a little bit. Quite honestly, when I was young and I watched my grandfather, who I hung out with a lot, when I watched my grandfather very eloquently and very boldly share his faith with other people, you know, uh, it, it scared me. It's like, I'm going to be, I'm gonna have to be like that? And, and, and sometimes we get around people that we kind of go, wow, I, I could never be like Billy Graham. Well, thank God you don't have to be. Amen. There's already been one Billy Graham. We don't need another. Sometimes we might stop and we might think, well, you know what? I, uh, if they call me up to sing a song, I'll have to be like, you know, Pastor Brent. No, you don't. There's already one of them. And thank God we don't need any more. Oh, thank God. I didn't really say that. Uh, and you don't have to be like me. Glory to God. We understand through the text that we're going to read in Acts chapter 1 that there is a call of, on all of our lives, believers to be a witness and testify about the good news of Christ. God will use you just the way you are already wired, and he will surprise you when you let him work through you. He'll surprise you because you'll say things and do things that you go, well, that wasn't me, obviously. Mary shared her testimony being, you know, in, in the ER and, and going on and, and, and really being there probably for somebody else. You know, we get put in situations in life. We go, God, why did you do this to me? When we ask questions like that, we should be saying, God, I know this wasn't necessarily your plan for my day, but what's up? What are we doing together? Amen? We're going to look at Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, and we're going to begin in verse 6. So, when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Now, understand the time and the place. Disciples, Jesus, Roman occupation, 
of Israel. They, they were the rulers. They were, so Israel, the Israelites were under the rule of the Roman government. They knew from Scripture that Messiah, who they agreed and they believed was Jesus, Messiah would come to set them free and he would restore the kingdom and they assumed that the kingdom meant, you know, Israel was going to be on this place of prominence. They really didn't have an understanding of what it was Jesus really was going to do. But that was the thing on their mind all the time. It says they kept asking him that. Some of us keep asking God about something that we are focused on and fixated on in life. And God wants us to get off of this subject because he has something else for us to focus on. Stop and, and, and just, just take an assessment when you're spending time with the Lord. Say, God, am I preoccupied with things that are not what I should be focusing on in life? I'm here to tell you we're going to hear that God has called us to be witnesses, and there is a world waiting for us to watch God work on a, on a daily basis in and through our lives when we stop asking the wrong questions. It's okay to ask God questions, and it's okay to go into Scripture and study out, you know, some kind of, a, you know, a rabbit hole, you know, research that you want to do. Some people get fixated on the book. This is an example. Fixated on the book of Revelation. The Bible does say he that reads it is blessed. So read it. If you are fixated on revelation and that is all you are consuming in your spiritual diet, you will miss what God wants to do in your life every day and through your life. Unless God has called you to travel the world and preach on the book of Revelation, it's probably not something that you should focus on solely. Amen? Okay. It's just like anything else. There's good food out there, but if, that's, if you eat that one thing and that's all you eat, you're going to be missing out on the nutrients that are out there in the fruits and vegetables and other things that are good for your life. Verse 7, Jesus replied, The Father alone has authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. So stop asking the question. Verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, how many would like the power of God to work in your life? Come on, that should be every single one of us. And I'm not necessarily saying you have to raise your hand in order to get a brownie button today. But you know what? I want the power of God working in my life. But if I want that, then I need to sign up for what the power is designed for. Sometimes we think the power of God is going to be focused on what my wants and what my needs are in life. If I just had the power, I could win this job. If I just had the power of God, I could get this woman to marry me. Whatever that is. You know, we, we oftentimes think that the, more, the closer we get to God, the more life becomes what we think it should be. And that's just the opposite of the truth. The closer we get to God, the more our life takes on His life the more we are passionate about His agenda. Amen. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be witnesses, my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I looked at this as I was reading it, and I realized there are circles. Jesus is drawing little circles here in Judea, excuse me, here in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. And Samaria really represents areas that they wouldn't normally want to travel. He's going to send you, God's going to send you to places you didn't necessarily sign up for. He's going to put you into predicaments and places like the ER in the hospital that you say, why, am, why is this happening to me, God? I, I don't deserve this. And he's probably going, you're right, but I need you there right now. This is the beautiful part about being in a walk of faith is you begin to get excited about places you didn't want to go and into situations that you are not, at least you think you're not prepared for.
I tell you. So what does the word witness mean in the Bible? What does it mean in this context? You'll be witnesses. The the, the definition will be on the screen. Martyreo is the Greek word that that we are reading here, and it means I witness, I bear witness, I give evidence, I testify. Can anybody see another word in that word, martyreo, that kind of gets you all excited? Martyr. Martyr. I get excited about that too. No, we don't. I'm just kidding, and none of you smiled. Martyr. You know, sometimes our witness, when we are obedient to God, sometimes we are martyred for our faith. You oftentimes read about believers historically in the past uh, or current, present day, especially in countries where Christianity is not acceptable. You cannot. It's some, some places it's outlawed to proselytize or have a Bible or share a Bible, and, and people are oftentimes martyred for their faith. In America, we don't, we don't know that kind of an environment. And as a matter of fact, when we talk about being martyred, we think of, well, I lost a friend because I shared Jesus with them. Okay, there's other people you can make friends with. Are you hearing me? And we don't know what sacrifice is in America. What we complain about are first world problems Tony and I, my wife and I, were on a plane to Tokyo two weeks ago. We were flying premium select on Delta Airlines. That was an expensive ticket. Premium select is not first class. It's not business class. It's one step below that. But we were ahead of everybody in coach. Our seats reclined further. They had buttons on the sides. We had footrests that came up, and they came and they served us food, and it was in glasses, and, and, and you know, the class actually was made out of glass, and it was like, whoa, we're living large here. Guess what? The entertainment system didn't work. Don't owe me. That's a ten and a half hour flight. I was being martyred for my faith. You see, some of us get so worried if we're going to stand up for Jesus. Well, what's going to happen? There's something bad's going to happen here if I am willing to testify. I use that as an illustration of how we get ruffled about the littlest things. What if you lose friends because you decide to be bold with your faith? Or just not even, I don't even want to use the word bold with your faith. I want to say just obedient to speak when God says speak. What if you lose your friends? What if, you, what if your family turns on you? What if people reject you? I asked the first service about what, what, what their concerns were when we're talking about martyrs and, and bearing witness. And, and the first word they came out was, was rejection. We don't want to be rejected. Every single one of us want to be loved. We want, to, we want people to like us. That's one of my biggest issues is I want, my, I want everybody to love me. And I, I'm telling you the truth. I love it when people love me. I, I, love, it. I, I love it when they, when they you know, are, are patting me on the back and saying, good job. It feels great. But you know what? If I'm not willing to suffer the consequences of being obedient to God, whether it's a witness or just being faithful, if I'm not willing to take the hits while I'm walking my faith out, you know what? Maybe, maybe, maybe you're not cut out for this. But God is. Being a witness for God has to do with sharing something good. Pastor Josh and I were talking about this earlier.
As a witness, you don't have to convince anybody to be saved. That's not what witnessing is all about. What witnessing is doing is do, doing what Mary did, sharing your story. When I, when I tell people, especially on my job, when I tell people that I moved here from Hawaii, the first thing they, they, they say is, well, what did you do that for? And I say, don't blame me. It was God's idea. And that right there opens doors. Either they run the other way because they don't want to hear what I have to say about God, or it opens the door. They go, what do you mean? And then I share my story. Being a witness is just telling other people the goodness of God, how it is revealed and how you have experienced it in your life. Amen? The concept of being a witness for Christ causes some of us to cower in fear, yet many of us are ardent evangelists when it comes to our favorite sports teams, our favorite restaurants, our favorite Netflix shows. You can't wait. You watch a movie or you watch a series and you get on the phone or you start texting. you got to watch this show. It's amazing. Do we do that after we read something in the Bible that kind of like, whoa, oh my God, get out your phone and start texting? We should be. We don't usually. Why? Because we think people don't want to hear that. <gasps> oh my goodness. I don't want to stand before God in heaven and hear, which I think I will, hear about all the opportunities I missed when he was going, say something now. They're ready. So let's just, let's just realize this. The more we believe in something, the more passionate we are about something, the more we want other people to experience that too. Amen? Matthew chapter 5. Let's go there. Verse 14. How many of you have a Bible in your hand right now? Anybody have a Bible in your hand? Does it have red letters in there and black letters? It's red and black. So Matthew 5 verse 14. What color are the letters? They are red. What does that indicate when you're reading a red letter edition? Jesus is doing the talking. Jesus says in verse 14, you are the light of the world. Who is he talking to? He's talking first to his disciples and then to us. Now, it's to us because the disciples aren't here anymore. So we have the words of Jesus and now they are speaking, speaking directly to us. You are the light of the world of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Now, how many of us here today feel like the light of the world? I don't see any hands. How many of us know that when Jesus said that, he meant it? Come on, even when we don't feel it. When you wake up tomorrow morning, well, this, you don't even have to wait till then. But let's just say, when you wake up tomorrow morning, I pray to God you remember those words. Jesus speaking, you are the light of the world. Now, how is your day going to go? Oh, that feels like a lot of pressure, Pastor. I don't know if I can do that. Oh, thank God you don't have to. All you have to do is plug into the power and let Jesus be the light. Verse 15, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. As I was meditating on this scripture the other night, I was heading to bed. I climbed into bed. I turned out the light. And all of a sudden, I heard God say to me, you don't accidentally do what you do. I thought, what? Now, I don't know how you hear God, 
but he talks to me and I, I know when he's saying something. And I got up out of bed. I was comfortable. He does that. He makes me uncomfortable and I am fed up with that. And, and I got up out of bed and I ran in and I got a pen and a piece of paper and I didn't even turn the light on and I'm scribbling. You don't accidentally do what you do hoping that it was on the paper and not the counter. And, 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 and I wrote that down so I could look at it the next morning and think about it, because I wanted to go to sleep. And I don't know why he can't talk to us during the daytime. It's always nighttime. It's because it's the only time my mouth's not talking, sometimes. So stop and think about that. You don't accidentally do what you do. And I, as I pondered that thought, what I got, and you might get something else, but he told it to me, so I'm not worried about what he told you. Um, wherever I am at and whatever I'm doing, it's not an accident. It's not an accident that you're here today. You didn't just wake up and go, I think I'll go to church. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to go anyways. That's not an accident that you pushed through and you got here. It's not an accident that Mary was in the hospital on Good Friday feeling like she was dying. But here's the problem. We oftentimes make an assessment of our situation. We make an assessment of our lives, of where we're at in life. Maybe you're jobless. Maybe you're homeless. Maybe you are spouseless. Maybe you are bankrupt. Maybe you have a disease. You could just line up all of those things and you could say, these are all the reasons why God is nowhere to be found in my life, so I'm not doing anything for him. Well, guess what? You're not in that situation by accident. I'm not saying God ordered that, but guess what? He is the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith and of our lives, and he orders our steps. And he makes sure that we will recognize it, that we feel him and we know he's there, irregardless of what it is we're going through. Mary knew she won. She wasn't there in the bed, you know, in the ER going, God, why did you do this to me? She's going, either way, whether I die or whether I live, I win. Mary, Mary, Linda and I were talking about that early. Both Linda and I have gone through open heart surgery. She's an overachiever. She's done it five times. I've only done it once. But you know what you do? We realized that when we were going in to have open heart surgery, that whether it works or it doesn't, we win. And if you have that outlook in life, guess what you're going to do? You're going to be a witness for the goodness of God. What's going on in your life? Uh, I'm unemployed right now. I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to figure out how I'm going to pay, pay the rent. Well, isn't it great that God's word already has an answer for that? It's not an accident. See, this all has to do with being an effective witness. So don't let your situation, your circumstance, your back pain, your arm pain, your body aches, your bank account, your broken heart because you got left in the, in the dust by your love, don't let any of that steal or rob you of the goodness of God. Amen. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, the lamp is placed on a stand. Here's the next question. You're a lamp placed on a stand in the house. What house is Jesus talking about? That's what the scripture says. It's placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. What house? And you don't need to answer the question, but I ask the question, what house are we talking about? And this is the answer I got, because I like to sail boats. The wheelhouse. You have a wheelhouse. You have interests. You have 
Areas that you're good at, your expertise, that's your wheelhouse. That's where Jesus wants you to shine. Now, not that you, not that, that you can't shine somewhere else. You can. But I love automobiles. I loved cars since I was a little toddler. And I love them, and I still love them. I'm still a car nut. And God has allowed me to not only pastor a church full-time for nearly 20 years, but I've been in the automobile industry for over 30 years and has allowed me to exercise that witness in the wheelhouse in my life. God places you in very specific places You know, based on your likes and your dislikes, your expertise, that's your wheelhouse. The Holy Spirit wants to work through you in your wheelhouse. Just think about that as as we move on. So, Pastor Josh, I don't know if you or or Becky, if if people have come to you like this, but when I pastored full-time... Uh, I had many people in the church come up and say, I want to work in the church. I want to I be around other believers so I can always feel uplifted. And you know what I would say to that normally? No, you don't. What if we all said, let's keep all the light bulbs in one closet? I just want to stay in this closet because there's so much light in the closet. And you know what Jesus would be saying? Come out of the closet. Amen. God wants to send us to the far reaches of the earth. I shared this with the first service. On this trip to Tokyo that we took two weeks ago, it's because... My love for God and my love for cars led me to the business I'm in. I've been, I've been at Subaru of Las Vegas for, uh, I start my 20th year in less than a month. And it, it, it brought me to a place where I am the general manager of this dealership. And this last year, we won the national Subaru Retailer of the Year. One retailer out of 630 in the entire nation, and we were awarded the Retailer of the Year. And that led to this invitation to Tokyo, where we went to the world headquarters of the corporation, and I found myself in the boardroom with all of these Japanese executives in the halls and the inner sanctum of Subaru Corporation, having an opportunity to share what God means to me and how I do what I do every day because of him. Now, I say that as an example of just going with the flow of the Holy Spirit. I never intended to be there. That's where Jesus took me. Where he wants to take you in your role, just go with it. Just be the witness he's called you to be. Amen? Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Your good deeds are a light that reflects the goodness of God, and they will reflect through a few things that I wrote down and a lot of other things that I didn't write down. What are some of them? How you live. How you live. Every day, people are watching how you are living your life. On your job, at your house, in your car, while you're driving down the road. We are being watched. People are listening to our conversation. How you talk. They are watching you on your job. What is your work ethic? Are you complaining that you're not paid enough for the job that you've been given to do? Is that a witness of the goodness of God? I think not. How you interact with others. People are watching us. All of this has to do with us being a witness. Don't think that you've got to talk a lot. 
It's these things and a lot more. The silent things. That people, they'll be drawn to you because of those things. Then they will want to hear what you have to say. And certainly they don't want to hear what we have to say if we're not doing those things well. Amen? I want to ask a question before we work on bringing this to a close. Do we pray every day, God, help me shine for you? That's in my prayer time, all the time going to work. Only one little tiny portion of my prayer is, God, help me to lead my team at work to be successful in the business that you've called me to manage. Most of my prayer time is, God, open doors of utterance so that I can share your love, shine your light, and speak your word. Help us to be an example for others and they're drawn to you, Father God. Amen. Let me give you a scripture here, Colossians 4, 2 to 4. This is from the message. So unless you have that in your hands or it's on your mobile device, look at the screen. Pray diligently. For what? Stay alert with your eyes wide open in gratitude. I want to stop right there. If you go to God in prayer and you're angry at God, that's okay. Just don't stay there. Realize that you take your anger, get it out. God, I can't stand where I'm at in my life right now. I hurt, I'm broke, I this, I that. And get it out. He's listening. He hears you. And then get to the place where say, God, thank you that you love me. And you gave yourself for me, Jesus. Help me to get my eyes back on you. Pray diligently. Stay alert with your eyes with wide open in gratitude. Don't forget to pray for us that God will open doors for telling the mystery of Christ even while I'm locked up in this jail. That's so important. Paul is admonishing the believers in Colossae. He's admonishing, pray for me that I would be a witness even if I'm in jail. Most of us, when we're not feeling happy, we're not giving God nothing. I'm not giving in the offering until he blesses me. I'm not going to tell people about Jesus until I feel he loves me. And we get into that place where we put conditions on our witness. Paul said, even if I'm locked up in jail, not getting fed the food that I'd like, not doing the things that I should be doing. Help me to take the time to recognize when God gives me an open door to speak. Mm, I love it. If you're taking notes, write this down. This is the point, I think, and I want to bring this to a point. One more short scripture, and I'm going to bring this to a close. But this is the point of this message today. Cultivate a constant awareness of those around you who God is preparing to hear the good news. I'm going to say that again. Constantly focus, excuse me, constantly cultivate an awareness of those around you who God is preparing to hear the good news. One of the things in business that I have absolutely ingrained into me, I'll be on the showroom floor of our dealership, and I'll just be standing there, and I might be talking to somebody, and I am absolutely aware of everything going on around me. I can see if a customer walks in the door and nobody has gone over to ask them, can we help you find some? Are you here to go to the parts department? Do you want to go to service? Can we answer any questions? I'm constantly aware of people around me and what it is that they might have need of. Even when I'm having this conversation with you, it's like a mother and a baby or whatever. 
You just fill in the blank. The awareness of people around you. God is working and He's speaking and He's moving in our midst, in people around us. Are we just focused on ourselves or are we constantly aware? God, there's people around me and the moment you point out somebody in particular, the moment a conversation goes a certain way and I know you want me to open my mouth and say something about you, I'm going to take advantage of that. Multitasking, I like that term. Always aware. I'll say it one more time. Cultivate a constant awareness of those around you who God is preparing to hear the good news. And this leads to the last verse of Scripture. John 6, For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. You and I are not the ones doing the work. God is doing the work. We're just helping to accommodate that good news, getting to the right place at the right time so God can draw the person to him.